G'day and welcome again to another Campfire Project discussion. And today, first of all, I have with me Andy Bryce, EFT Master from over there in uh, England. How are you, Andy? I'm uh, doing pretty well, all things considered. Excellent. Thanks. And then we have Michael Laurier, who is the author of Forging Excalibur, Rediscovering Your Masculinity down there in Melbourne. How are you, uh, uh, Michael? Always good. Thanks, Alan. Excellent. And we also have uh, Thomas Graham, who's an Indigenous radio personality from here in Newcastle. How are you, uh, Thomas? Good, mate. How are you? Really good. Uh, we've been uh, talking about um, the subject for tonight as far as, you know, the what's the definition or, of uh, success for a man going into the, the through the changes of uh, COVID? What are we going to be like when we come out the other side? What's the progression of what we've come into, how we've got here, and what is going to be the de definition for success of a man into the future? And I was wondering, if, you know, Michael, would you start us off on this? Yeah, cool. Okay, so um, the the modern def our modern definition of success has always been around uh, the acquisition of material possessions and monetary wealth uh, and societal status. Really, that's where that's where it sits in terms of success. And we find that that puts a lot of men, especially, under pressure in order to feel relevant and uh, and well successful in our society. And my hope is that as we're going through this period of time now through such a transitional time of uh, disruption really where people are starting to lose or begin or even just beginning to see that those things that they really attached a sense of identity to which is their jobs and money and all sorts of things like that um, and you know possessions as well because a lot of people have lost their jobs they can't afford lease payments on fancy cars they can't afford uh, mortgages on big houses etc cetera, etc cetera. these things that we acquire because we want to feel successful and so my hope for the future is that as we move out of this and into a different version of, a, of society in our world that we will start to redefine what success actually means and i'd like to know i'd like to i'd like to believe that that's going to mean that we start to define success in more in terms more of at what level of service and contribution can we have um, in our communities within our families in society and what difference can we make positive difference in um, in humanity as well because when we start to make it about other people and we make our objectives and our goals and our purpose bigger than us as individuals and bigger than our own individual sense of success then i think uh, that that will start to create a very a very connected society uh, with you know if everyone's out there being of service to each other and contributing positively Okay, and uh, what's your thoughts on that, uh, Andrew? Sorry, I just I'm muted <laughs> because the movers are <laughs> walking by the door ten feet away. Um, well, I think there's a balance to be struck because there are not many sugar mamas. You, if you're a man, you're going to have to support yourself. There's nobody that you, you know. It's not going to work that that we give up the the uh, drive and the uh, and uh, to support ourselves and our families um so i i think it's instead of pursuit of happiness which often gets twisted to mean a bmw or another house or something like that um and and doesn't really exist uh but we change it to a pursuit of meaning and having and you know uh, I know that Thomas has his faith and that <laughs> provides meaning. And, uh, and I think that one of the, the things that's missing in North America where I spent most of my life is, is there's not many people with a sense of purpose and they're not. Uh, so when you have a purpose that's ongoing and I think, uh, if we can help people discover, uh, their sense of purpose and and uh, meaning in their lives, then um, it doesn't matter whether it's an easy day or a hard day because you don't really know your commitment on an easy day. Mm. You find out what you're committed to in a lockdown or in a crisis or a challenge. And how about you, uh, Thomas? Yeah, I think, um, especially because one, I'm the youngest on the call, but... Um, which means I've only finished school probably 10 years ago. I think purpose was driven out of us in school. Um, we, we were 
although there are great elements to to the schooling uh, schooling and education system, um, it never prepared us for for world the world or life uh, or life after school and and what that can bring. Um, and so, like, I think when we look at how we're going to be be successful as as men the thought comes through my mind when we, when we reassess our purpose to provide service to someone else, I think that's a, probably a purest form of, of someone's happiness. If we want to talk about the pursuit of happiness or to the pursuit of, of meaning. Um, when we pursue for, I think it was Gandhi that said that service to someone else is, is high up there. Um, that's my quote, my, <laughs> my way of saying it. Cause I can't remember the full quote, but, um, yeah, there's a lot that there's a lot that the world tells us to do, and there's a lot that the world tells us not to do. And and to provide service to someone else is definitely something that the world doesn't tell us to do. It's all about us. Mm. How are we individually going to rise up and step up and provide for our family? Um, well, that's as as Adam uh, Andy said. Um, I haven't reached that point yet because uh, I haven't had kids or anything like that. Um, but like, and Alan, you know this, um, like Soul Cafe is all about providing or, or extending a helping hand to, to those that need it around us. And, and when we immerse ourselves around someone or something that generally has the best intentions for us, I think that's the, uh, a really good place to start looking for purpose or start looking for meaning because there's no agendas. There's no hidden, um, hidden messages or anything like that. We, and, and this is pretty much the, the campfire project. We're generally here to get the best out of, out of each other. Like that's, that's it. There's no agenda for us to go, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to mentor John um, and, I'm going to steal his money or whatever. Like it's, there's nothing like that. It's us just getting on a, a, a call that's free and mm. sharing our view uh, on topics uh, to, to make sure that we can provide service to someone else. Mm. And so for me, that's my purpose. Mm. Uh, and this is an easy, easy way for, uh, for me to fulfill my purpose. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Cause I always say it's, um, We've got to have a purpose of one form or another. Without a purpose, well, we're totally lost. If we look back through history, men had what we had was that hero intelligence. As a hero, you know, we'd go to wars, we'd put our lives on the line, we'd do all of that sort of thing too. And we were given, we were recognised, we were given value. You know, we got sex because it was all about the fact that we were able to then operate and present ourselves as a man. Then that. You know, we haven't had wars for some time, not in Australia anyway. And the end result is for most people that hero intelligence transferred into the boardroom where then it was making, making the killing there. You know, there were all these people wanting to be the man being in charge, making money and everything else. But now that's been knocked on the head with all the isolation because there's so many men that realise that that's not really the future. Everything's changed. So where do we go as we come through and into the next phase? Because we don't know what the next, the new norm's going to be, but it's certainly not going to be the old norm. And I think one of the traps that we've fallen into as men over the years is that we've identified very deeply with our ego and the mm. ego really wants success and it wants achievement and it wants all these sorts of things to, as I said before, to remain relevant in our community. And you were talking about the boardroom just then, Alan. Within the boardroom, there's testosterone and ego flying around all over the place. And it's, a, it's, a, it's all about one-upmanship. And that's what corporate has become. And so I think it's a really, really wonderful thing that corporate, in many ways, has actually just been shut down and people are now working from home because the boardroom now is non-existent. And so people have to jump on Zoom calls and uh and present themselves in that way so it's a bit different it's very very different and i think it's helped to create more of a community between these people instead mm. of a comp uh, an environment of competition and i have as i said before i have hopes that this will transform parts of our society into uh 
areas where we can contribute to each other and be of service to each other instead of all these egos bouncing off each other and running around and 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 living and people living unconsciously just chasing this false version of success with which they believe will provide them some level of fulfillment uh, and I think we're seeing a lot more fulfillment now in society and in people because we get to spend more time with our families and we get to engage in things that we're passionate about and things that we enjoy and people that we love spending time with. And we've missed that over the, over the last, especially over the last 20 years or so, when we've been in this society that's been driving forward towards, um, you know, technological growth and economic change and there's so many things happening in our world. And I think this is a really good message, a really good um, disruption for us to stop and take stock of what we truly value and, and connect with our core values and find our purpose as we were talking about earlier. Mm. And, I, and I'm hoping that that's going to be the energy moving out of this. Excellent. Yeah, so look at the, um, well, as you said, the, the corporate in the boardroom, the, the testosterone there and that was where everyone's trying to be the man who's got the most toys wins type attitude whereas now and, and women have had it over us for a while in the fact that you know they could stay at home and have children and have children and raise the family they could go to work full-time and go into the corporate world or they could do or took both of those things in a compromise in some level or another do both of them whereas mm -hmm. men the only thing we really had was in one thing to compensate for all three of those and that was to make money well, right now, <laughs> that's really been knocked on the head. Because so many that's, what, that's what we can measure, right? So we go off and we do a job and we whatever it is that we do and then we come home and then our relevance, our, our status, I guess, or even within the family is judged and measured based on can we put good food on the table, keep a good roof over our family's head, um, a safe, reliable car and a nice house in a nice area and the stuff and the holidays and the clothes and the this and the that providing for everybody. And if we can't, then we're called into question mm. or if we don't, we're called into question. And so, but when we do what's required of that is very different. So what's required of a man that provides at a high level is he spends lots of time at work and he spends lots of time, um, you know, chasing business or whatever it is that he does. And so he doesn't spend as much time at home. And then he's almost demonized sometimes for not spending as much time with the family as what he could. And so you kind of go, well, where's the balance here? And where can I feel like I'm a good provider and a good family man and a good husband or partner as well and still find that really, you know, that sweet spot where I'm providing for my family and they're all feeling, um, you know, loved and connected with me because I spend time with them too. So I'm hoping that's all changing. I'm seeing it change gradually. And I hope it will. I hope it will continue because I think connection is very important for us all. It's one of our needs. One of you know, It's on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Connection. And mm. so we've got more of that now and I think we need to nurture that. And mm. I think that will help us redefine our society and our world and our attitude as well. Yeah, so it's a man looking at what his traditional role or his perception of what the traditional role was and now revaluing it into today's society and what that really looks like no longer just based on being the provider. But so as I said, the women have had the ability to provide, they had the ability to raise the family and had the combination of both. Well, the man's been doing the, trying to do the providing, now that's been taken away. So it's an idea of, well, where to next? What do we, how do we look at this? How do we expand on the ability of what we had? Because to just go out and kill the beast, so to speak, really left us away. And as you said, we're away from home. Men were out there earning money to give it to somebody who would spend it after they died because men were killing themselves out in the workplace. Mm. And so realizing now this, this present time has sort of knocked that on the head and gone, well, right now that's not going to happen anymore. The money's not going to be the way it was before getting out in the boardroom and making the money as you have been. is not going to be the norm into the future. So we've got to look at things differently. And I was wondering Imagine if we could, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Imagine if we could still be providers though, because that's something that, that is at our core is in oh, terms definitely. of a need, mm. in terms of service, right? And uh, imagine if we could still be providers, but in a way that engages us deeply with something that's that we're it. passionate about. Yeah. So, yeah. So this is where core values and purpose come in because when we're doing something with purpose, we're doing it with passion as well. And we enjoy it. It doesn't feel like work. And 
we're still providing for our families, but we're actually filling our own cups at the same time. And I think that's the key. When we, we, we fill everybody else's cup, but we don't fill our own. And ours is often empty. Mm. And as a result, that's when we feel uh, that's when we feel less than and not worthy. And, and, you know, we're not being a good husband or father or even, even business person because we just don't feel deeply connected to what we're doing. I'm really interested in the, uh, the younger viewpoint as well, because I think, you know, Thomas, I, would I be right in saying, I said, thinking that younger people have been looking at what their fathers were doing and thinking, well, we need something better than that. We need our pet families around. What's the viewpoint today of the younger people? Because I think there's probably going to be a lot of lessons that us older guys are going to learn from the younger ones in the way that they look at things already. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a massive difference between uh, how um, myself and my father grew up. Uh, my father was a mechanic, a qualified mechanic, and uh, he was very good at doing what he did. Um, and so that was him. Like, But he took something that he loved. Uh, he loved cars and cars were a passion of his. And so it was fitting for him just to be a mechanic to fix cars. Um, and so when I became older um, and had some kind of brains, um, much hasn't changed. Um, <laughs> but I, I made a conscious decision within myself. It probably would have been about 10 um, when I was 10 and um, I, I looked at him and he was dirty, greasy, like oily. And I'm like, there is no way in hell I'm ever going to do anything that includes grease, oil, um, and car parts. And I'm just like, nah, dad, you can have that. Um, I'll pay someone or I'll pay you um, <laughs> to fix my cars for me. But I think, I think, in that time, obviously we still need a lot of people to, to be mechanics, to be chefs, to be lawyers and, and doctors and whatever, uh, in a more traditional aspect of making money, um, and, and employment. But I think from a young point, person's perspective, we're, we're in a time where we can choose, we have options, mm. um, and options can be amazing and options can be very daunting because we don't know what we want. Um, mm or there's too much out there to choose one thing. Mm. And so I think if there's any young people listening now, um, I don't think there is a concern for you to have all the right answers uh, or to know what you want straight away. Coming out of school, I never had or never knew what I wanted. Um, I dropped out of school and went into a a chef's apprenticeship. Um, But (laughs) I'm no longer in a chef's apprenticeship um, I qualified and, and now I'm a communications assistant um, at Soul Cafe. So like doing more stuff on the computer and doing more stuff technology wise because I've been born into that. Um, so the, I think the biggest um, disadvantage for young people today is the perception from their parents that they're not doing what they want to do. Um, because it's not the way that their parents did it. Um, because, and I love my mum and I love my dad, and uh, but they they haven't come with the time in a sense. Like they haven't, because they've gone through it that way. Everyone else has to do it that way or go through it that way in a sense. That's kind of their their mantra, their mindset. Uh, but for a young person go out and make money doing TikToks. I hate that. I'm not into it, but that's, it's the possibility now. Like I walked to my, my, um, my Japanese family, uh, family's house. Um, my Asian sensation, I call him my best friend. Um, and there was a young girl. I think it was a young girl. Um, let's say it's a young girl. Um, I don't want to say anything. Did, uh, bad over this and she was doing a tiktok uh in the driveway of the house the camera's up against the ipad was up against the garage and here she is doing a little dance right there's gamers out there that are making thousands a week by gaming professionally like whether that's cod or 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 fortnite 
never in our wildest dreams would our parents think that would make money, but mm. it's making a lot of money for, for some kids that are really, really good. So like there's so many options and avenues out there that, that young people can take. Uh, and that alone is daunting for a young person because if we turn to our mum or dad, they don't have the expertise to, to give us adequate information to go down that way. But if there was anything I would suggest is just do something that you actually enjoy doing and you enjoy to do uh, and, and love, whether that is doing something like this, um, even though it's free and doesn't, doesn't get me paid, I still love doing it. Um, whether that's doing website design or whether that's doing um, radio stand engineering or whatever. There's so many opportunities around that people can do because simply because they love to do that and just do it. Like you have the option to say in six months, you don't like it, then you can go to something else. Like there's a lot of options there. You've got time is, is the biggest thing I would say. I think the one key word that really stood out when you were saying that when they go out to find things that, you know, the stuff they love, things that they enjoy doing. And then that's when you know, you're on purpose. You know, that's when you, you can really express your passion and that's when life becomes a lot easier, no longer a, a drudge or a, you know, a, a struggle. Yeah. And, and I think an easy way to define something that you love is the thing you do the absolute best at with the least amount of effort. Hmm. Like for some, like for example, for Colonel Sanders, it was frying chicken. Hmm. Like he was good at frying chicken and everyone loves Colonel Sanders or KFC, you know, like for, for you, Ellen, it's, it's reading people's face hmm. faces. Um, Michael, it's, it's empowering, empowering men or people in your life. And, and Andy, you, you're just, you looking look old like jesus <laughs> <laughs> so, i think mean i'm 2000 years old right <laughs> well, here we are the three of us old it. guys sitting here and the young fellow's been giving us a hard time since we started michael is 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 quite younger than than what you two are <laughs> Oh, now you're dividing it even further. So we're yeah. my screen, the two older guys are at the top, the two younger ones at the bottom. So we've got a division on the horizontal here. Well, yeah. well Michael and myself, I'm top right and Michael is below me. And then Andy and Alan are on that side. So literally, Well, I can't fool myself into saying that I'm young anymore. I'm probably approaching middle age now, if anything else. But that's all right. I think um, I was going to say one of the things that you touched on earlier was around um, doing what you love and finding what it is that you love. And I've found that that's a really good way, a really good road to go down to start to figure out what your purpose is. Mm. Um, because what you do is you do what you're passionate about and you do what you love. Mm. And the thing that you can do that time just passes and you don't even realize and mm. you forget to eat and you forget to sleep and all of a sudden it's one o'clock in the morning like it was for me last night. And I'm sitting there and I'm I'm doing my podcast, my first episode, and I'm editing it. I'm making sure it's all perfect, and I'm doing what I love. I love doing what I do, and I started at nine o'clock, and I thought I'll just this will only take me an hour and a half, maybe two hours, and famous then I'll go to bed. Words. And and then I looked, hey, so I said famous last words, those ones. I know, I know, <laughs> and then and then I thought, awesome, it's done. And I looked at the clock; it was one a.m. nearly nearly 1 a.m. and I thought oh my god anyway I lost track of time and so you know you know that when you when that happens that you're in your zone of genius that you're doing what you love and you're passionate about and so then if you can start to think about how that particular thing that you're passionate about that you lose track of time when you're doing how you can then create something from that that can be of service to others then you can do one of two you can do two things with that uh, three things you can live your passion which becomes a purpose when you're serving others and, at, and on top of that as well you get to make a living from doing so too mm. and so for the younger people who are listening who are going there's so many options out there i don't know what to do first start with what you love mm. and thomas you, you hit the nail on the head start with what you love um what you can spend abundant amount of time doing without mm. without even thinking about the time or losing track of the time 
and then start to find a way to use that to contribute to others and help others and be of contribution. And then you monetize it if you can. That's right. You're going to say something, Andy? Yeah, I think... Um, yes, Jesus. <laughs> we uh, bless, bless you, my son. This is kind of a comedy show, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and the way the camera does it backwards, I'm, I, I don't know. Anyway, so, um, yeah, I think, you know, for me, uh, when you were talking about uh, things being different for the young people today, and in some ways, the circumstances or the, or the details are different, but I, I have a client who is talking to on Saturday, he's 74. And when he was a teenager, his father wanted to, to work in, in retail where he would make a basic wage. So this was like in the sixties, but he was such a good guitarist. He could play on the street for four hours and make a week's money. Mm. So we know he was Van Halen. And so, so when somebody's good at what they do, and you can make that kind of money in, in, it was in San Francisco. They, you know, they throw money away around there. Um, but the um, the point I think is that even then, his father had an idea of how you should do it, hmm. and uh, didn't endorse or support uh, my friend in. Uh, he didn't even get, and it's very you know that you could make that kind of money. And it wasn't hard. It wasn't a struggle. Mm. So some things are uh, still similar, but uh, somebody once told me, uh, do, a, do what you love that you can get paid for. And, mm. and uh, Thomas's dad being a mechanic, if you've been in a, in a, uh, a shop uh, garage uh, recently, there's no grease. Mm. It's totally clean. So um, there are these things, you know, when I, when I worked as a carpenter, I could go, go buy a building and say, you know, I worked on that. There's a sense of uh, satisfaction. Um, what we seem to have done is devalued working with our hands and doing craft things and not necessarily craft, but, but mechanics, electrician. Um, we've been, I think over focused on on higher education, and now we hardly in North America we hardly have any electricians, uh, nurses. My dad was a psychiatric nurse. Um, you know why would people b go into those uh, jobs now if not if not because they felt like they were serving? So I feel like uh, a purpose comes from knowing your values. And when you know your values, you can, you can create a purpose. And when you connect with your purpose, that's ongoing. It's not like a goal that has a time limit and a result. A, a purpose is, could last beyond your life. But what it does is it gives you something to measure your goals against. If you have a purpose, you can say, will this advance the purpose or take me away from the purpose? And it really is essential in making the best use out of goals and knowing where you're going. Excellent. Yeah, agreed. <clears throat> yeah, well, let's see. Sorry, it's a bit of a ramble there. <laughs> no, that's all good. The, um, cause I think about, you know, when I was looking at jobs and I was looking for what can I actually do? Um, I left school at uh, the end of year 10. I didn't want to go to year 11 or 12. I didn't, didn't believe I had the brains for it. I suggested I um, become a cabinet maker, a carpenter. So I joined a company that ended up being a, a um, uh, what do you call it, a, a factory job. So it wasn't really as a carpenter. I then decided I'd go back to school, didn't know how I was going to get through. And luckily the old postmaster general's department picked me up in, uh, after I'd already not really qualified for the final for the examination they put us through, but they had that many dropouts that they accepted me. But in that stage, I didn't have a clue what I wanted to do. I couldn't see, I was just trying to grab a job. That was what it was about. And I think, you know, a lot of uh, men have gone through that over the years and that just finding the first thing that they could get because 
that's what we had to do. We had to get a job. We had to provide. We had to pay, you know, pay pay our way and everything else. And we just took anything. And therefore, that's one of the reasons why so many men are unhappy in the workplace. And depression and other things were high. But now I'm looking at and thinking, well, with the younger ones, with the right, because you know, their attitude's different, and it's a different world. It's not going to be the jobs that we had before. What can you know, so older men do to support the younger ones and then help to draw out of them different ideas of moving forward? Because I think the new ideas of where we're going to go are more likely to come from the younger ones than those, us older ones, simply because of the experiences they've lived through. You know, if I look at millennials, the younger generations, it's all about uh, families because my parents, the builders, they were about survival. They went through wars. It was like the bottom level of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the survival. Then it was the baby boomers. We were all about security, next level up. Once we had our food for today and our food for tomorrow, the next thing was the Gen Xs. They were looking about, well, where's my, you know, where's my recognition? They were the ones who wanted titles on their business cards and everything goes. And then we had the, you know, their kids were latch kids. What happens when they finish school? They go home and wait for their parents to come home. Mm. So they're wondering, where's the family? So as we get you know, kids are you know, getting you know, through the younger generations, there's more movement towards that um, back to being the family. So I think this is one of the reasons why some of the ideas we can get from the younger ones are going to be quite surprising for us and quite, um, quite knowledgeable in a different way. Yeah, I agree with that. I'm one of those Gen Xs where um, it, was, it was like that for me. It was definitely like that for me. But I also had the attitude from my father when I was talking about things that I wanted to do as a teenager. He'd say, well, no, you can't do that, Michael. You can't feed a family with that. You can't feed a family doing that job. And, you know, he had my best interest at heart because that's all he knew. That's and that's it. what he did. And he did very well, right? So he provided for all of us very, very well. So absolutely no criticism or judgment there because that's what he knew what to do and he did it really well. But then that he, then, that, you know, we pass those beliefs onto our children. And so I grew up with this belief as a teenager that I had to go out there and do something that was going to provide adequately for a family. And it didn't matter what I enjoyed or what I loved because that was never going to make any money. It's about going out there and getting a full-time job, climbing the ladder. Um, and then you stick with something for long enough and you'll do well and you'll make money and, You'll support your family and you'll have security and so we're seeing all of that unravel now aren't we over the last few years we've seen all of that unravel and people of my generation are really stepping up in a real in a in a good way so i'm 45 i'm turning 46 next month and people of my generation many of them not all of us but many of us are actually stepping up and going actually no um, i've done that but i also want something for myself and i want to feel like i'm um, contributing I have there's some meaning and there's some relevance to what I do and there's some substance as well and so one of the driving things for me and the people that I work with I always encourage them and this is what I do as well it's like how are you going to leave a mark on the planet how when you get to end of life what have you done to make the world better than when you came in and so and I, and I would love for that attitude to be passed on to younger the younger generations the millennials and, and generation Z, I think, I don't know what we're going to do after Z. There's no more letters left, but, um, but I would love for that attitude to be passed on to them. Can you imagine the society that we'll create in the future? If we have all of these people who are being of service and contributing to each other mm. and, and doing so with such a vision that they want to leave this beautiful legacy that goes beyond money. It's about, attitude it's about values it's about all these things that we're talking about purpose and so we then have a society where everybody works for the common good as opposed to working for each other for, for themselves yeah, and i think we've got a good chance of that happening if we nurture it the right way because you know the paradigms that we had about you know being a provider look being the, the one out front that's all changed with the the lockdowns and everything else, we've started seeing social media being used as it should be used. And that was to be socially connected. Mm -hmm. you know? We've been physically isolated, been physically distancing from people, but a lot of us have been using in a way in which we're just so much more connected socially to people than we've ever been connected before. And the conversations have been more respectful because people don't, we're already feeling isolated. We don't have a fight with somebody and feel even more isolated. So mm -hmm. we're changing our thinking in a lot of ways. So as long as we come out of that, and hang on to that um, learning, then I think that we've got a, 
a good opportunity to uh, move forward in a new way. Agreed. Yeah. And I just want to say two things quickly. Um, one, going back on your question, Alan, about uh, the difference between um, your time, my time. Um, I think prehistoric and <laughs> thank you for jumping on by the way yes. Michael yes okay I take you out of the old fellas category I've got 20 years on you over 20 <laughs> thank you and, and, and if I'm looking as good as you Michael at 45 I'm happy um, oh, I appreciate that thank you Thomas not not so sure about 60 with Alan <laughs> well, it's about, no, I didn't, haven't seen 60 for quite a few years well, 75 plus <laughs> um, I think there's a greater expectation because of the greater accessibility of knowledge today that younger people in coming into the workforce are required to be qualified, whether that's tertiary studies or whether that's um, university or whatever, um, which for me, I'm kind of more in the, the, the setting of um, pre dinosaur age, Alan, um, uh, no, but all Come honestly, on, bring it on. <laughs> um, so disrespectful. <laughs> well, I noticed the expression on his face before, Andy, Andrew, when you were saying about um, uh, having been a carpenter after he just called you Jesus, and I saw the look on his face at that point. I went, here we go. Um, but, yeah, so, so say boomers, uh, ba sorry, baby boomers, boomers is a bit of an insult for you guys, uh, baby boomers uh, time, it wasn't as as qualified in a sense. You just got in, you, you did some work experience, you mm. you, you learnt on tools. Um, and so I'm more that way inclined. I, I've got a lot of um, knowledge in, in just getting in, doing the job and going home. Um, and I've only got one ticket of, of commercial cookery, sorry, two and, and certain business. Um, so like there's, my experience well and truly outweighs my qualifications. So um, that's, that's a big thing for, for a young person to come into a role because a lot of employees are, are demanding qualifications or, or one, two, three years of experience before getting into the role. So that's a bit of a challenge. But to the second thing I want to talk about is uh, the legacy um, and, and Michael touched on it before and, I think we need to prioritize what our legacy looks like um, because especially for a young person, um, I now have the, the uh, I wouldn't say pressure, uh, but I have the pleasure to, to live my dad's legacy on. Um, and so he was a very loving supporting and caring man and i'm so glad i get to do that because that's pretty much me in a nutshell um i'm not a mechanic <laughs> i can't i can't get my fat fingers down in a certain hole with with little tiny nuts and bolts uh, but i can definitely love care and, and support someone or some many people so it's it's tough to 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 look at 20, 30, 40, 50 years uh, into the future, plus what's it going to look like post-life mm. um, and, and how is my legacy going to live on? Um, I think the, the greatest way for your legacy to continue is by servicing others. Mm. Your legacy, like Mother Teresa, mm. like she's long past, but... Uh, the work that she did for society in her, in her world uh, is lived on today. Gandhi lived on today. Martin Luther King lived on to, it's lived on today years mm. beyond uh, their passing like Nelson Mandela and, and the list goes on. So I think we can be a Nelson Mandela in our own lives uh, for those around us. And as someone or from a young person, it's, it's definitely, an encouragement because we can learn a lot from them uh, very easily because of the knowledge so accessible. So um, yeah, that's what I want to add into that. And there's also a certain wisdom that comes with age as well with, and wisdom comes from experience. And so when you start to live, when you live a little bit, when you have a life and you go through adversity and you struggle and get through it and overcome it all, 
and you start to learn some lessons and grow from those experiences, you develop wisdom. And with that wisdom comes awareness. And with the awareness comes a deep connectedness to the self. And when you have that deep connectedness with the self, you just have a knowing of what it is that you want to do and how you want to serve the world. And then legacy becomes something that just comes as a natural result of that, as a natural result of service and contribution. So it's a just a, it's just a journey, you know. So you, how old are you now, Thomas? Twenty six. Twenty six. Oh, to be twenty six again. So twenty six, <laughs> and uh, and uh, yeah, you've still got some years to go before you develop that wisdom. Not that you don't have any now, but mm. as you as you grow and you move right. forward and you experience, you know, you gain wisdom that is invaluable that you can share with others. And legacy comes as a natural result of the service and the contribution. Mm. Yeah. Very much so, I think. We, um, uh, I have a business associate and we have been working with uh, high net worth families for uh, about six years and uh, helping them communicate. And uh, one of the, the things that they, uh, statistics is that if you um, create a fortune within three generations, 90% of the time it's lost. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, uh, lots of reasons, but people think those kind of people think their legacy is money. Mm. But if those are the, if the data is 90% of the uh, fortunes are lost in three generations, then money isn't a legacy. The legacy is actually the wisdom and, and sharing that and uh, sharing the values and, and, and actually living a life that people can look at and go, yeah, that that was uh, that has meaning. Uh, so it doesn't really matter what net worth your parents had, but if they lived a life that um, uh, expressed wisdom and had meaning, and and you knew you were loved, then that's that's legacy. Well, that's and, and then, it, of course, you can get into uh, the Gandhi, Mother Teresa level of uh, legacy, but. It doesn't have to be grandiose. It doesn't, but there's an there's an interesting there's an interesting t- statistic that I saw uh, or I read. I don't know, maybe a, maybe a year ago now, and it's each every person, directly or indirectly, comes into contact with eighty thousand people, different people, individuals in their lifetime, wow. right? And so each one of us so, um, is going to come into contact with three hundred and twenty thousand people in our lifetime. So something that one of us says here tonight, for instance, and it's just isolated to the four of us, if one of us says something that's just epic tonight, if one of us has or will, and then that has a positive impact on the three others, and then that makes them, it changes them a little bit, and then we go off and we impact and influence 80,000 people from that different version of ourselves, Mm. then that creates legacy in and of itself, doesn't it? Because then those 80,000 people will come into contact with another 80,000 people. So you can see how that compounds. Mm. And if we have enough people doing that really well, we transform society. We transform humanity, don't we? So you don't have to be Mother Teresa. you just got to be an awesome person, spreading some awesome wisdom and being a kind, good um, human being. And if you set the, your standards just for yourself, you don't worry about, if, if take the learn, learnings and the lessons that you get from knowing about Gandhi and Mother Teresa and things like that. But as far as it goes, it's the focus that you put into your own life, as you said, it's who you are and how you move forward. Because we know that everything that happens around us, it's like the movie Sliding Doors, just a slight change can just change your future completely. So how everybody responds, it's like listening to these conversations, I know that some people will not you know, take the learnings out of it. They'll look at, say, some of the things that were said at the time that might have been the joking and things like that. Or they hear a comment of one form and that's what they focus on. They miss whatever else has been talked about. So their pathways change immediately. Every time, this is one of the reasons, <clears throat> excuse me, why I like these uh, discussions because I'm always learning all the time from everybody I'm talking to. Regardless of where I am in my life, I'm always going to continue learning. And in that, I know that my... If, what I, if I hadn't had this conversation tonight and I went out tomorrow and I was talking to people, the conversations I'd have with them would be completely different to what they will be after tonight. Only slightly different or whatever, but 
the end result is it does give a difference. And it's like mm. you're one degree off when you're shooting a rocket from the, the Earth to the moon. It's going to miss the moon by you know, massive mileage. You know, it mm. won't even probably even see it through its uh, vision at all. It'll just disappear completely because that gets bigger and bigger as you go. So I think one thing is to keep a check on ourselves, to keep those little corrections. As I say, to go to the moon, they only correct it only so many times. It's off angle, puts it back on angle, goes off angle, puts it back on. So it's only a fraction of the time that's actually on target, but it gets to the moon. Mm. And that's one thing I think it's, you know, well, for me, I keep looking at, well, where am I now doing that little check? Am I being of service? Am I doing the right thing? How am I impacting on other people? What's the value that I'm actually delivering? You see, uh, the comment that um, a little saying that I heard some time back and I, I thought, yep, I have been doing that. And that is what you do for yourself dies with you, but what you do for the other people and for the world isn't always will be eternal. Yep. So by being of that and while you're doing that, you feel so much better about yourself as well. So you're actually improving your own health while you're helping other people. While you're just out there trying to be the man, making all the money and everything else, the end result is that you're lonely, you're on your own, that's got to be damaging your health. So how many people have got a lot of money, don't really have those relationships, and their yeah. life is crap? Yeah. People find that out the hard way, unfortunately, don't they? They accumulate all this money, and as they're accumulating the money, they lose everything they truly value. And then they're left there sitting alone with a fat wallet and an empty home. Mm. Yeah. Well, on that uh, comment you made about the, the 90 years, well, I heard it as the, there's the first generation makes the money, the second generation grows the money, and the third generation loses the money. Yeah, that's why I said 90% of the time it's lost in three generations. Yeah, that, that's hmm. apparent. But um, my dad used to say that he'd uh, rather be rich and unhappy than poor and unhappy. But, uh, you know, he, he <laughs> I don't think that's... Uh, um, a, a fact to live by. Mm. Yeah. So with you look at that, you know, the first person made the money, the second one was then driven to actually increase the money. What was the third one's involvement in that? Were they really connected to, you know, the, the grandchild, was that connected to their father? All the well, way through? And so they're the trust fund yeah, kids. They're, they're the trust fund kids. Mm. Well, they, yeah, the, my experience of working with these families is that the, if, some families have been wealthy for a long time, but let's say it's three or four generations working with um, uh, people who own wineries for three or four generations in California, uh, people who have banks in, in uh, Geneva, um, lots of different situations. But if granddad made the money, uh, his kids um, didn't see him because he was out making money. That's it. But if they didn't have money when they were little, they knew there was a different, um, you know, he was out working, but we didn't have money. Then they grow up and they've got the money now and the grandchildren are, grow, are being raised either to be a trust fund kid, but they're, they're, they assume mm. wealth. Mm. Their their childhood, the third childhood, is so different than the first ones. They have different values, and then they and so they don't even know what it's like to work for something. Mm. And I think because that's a level of entitlement there, isn't there? Yeah. So all the fact focus is on the money. The true uh, important things are just being totally missed. Yeah, I mean, what we were trying to do and, and part of the, this program was to help them build a, a communication so that then they could develop um, what some, some long-term wealthy families have. Uh, you get, when you become, you get your education paid for, you get, you get uh, um, uh, your first home paid for, but then you have to pay it back or you have to go to financial, um, family financial meetings because you know maybe some people their their job is to manage the the fortune but if you have if all you do is take money then uh out of the the pot um <clears throat> these families have a structure where you actually 
work with it? How is it going to benefit the, the, um, the future generations, five, 10 generations? How is it going to be used to generate, to um, uh, it, it charity and, and to work with uh, in service? So it's a, but the first part of it is to be able to um, have all the generations communicating. And that, that is the, uh, that's where I come in because we worked with, with that. And um, the legacy then isn't the money, it's, it's wisdom and how to, um, how to be in service, which it's, um, when you have something, you have something to give. If you're, if you're in the gutter, you have nothing, you, you don't have anything to help other people with. So I think, um, I think it's respectable and, um, and really achieving and, and using money to support other people and service is, is really the only reason to have it. But these people are hoarding it. When you think about some families have, well, what do they say? 1% of the population has 75% of the money. Yeah. It's uh, criminal, really. So, we were, so we, were trying to, we were trying to counteract that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So if we were moving from before the situation now where the father was always out working, disconnected from the children, and now we've been in a situation where we're going to come out the other side and our paradigms about the money and everything else, all this situation has left so many men no longer feeling like the providers, etc. What sort of advice or what suggestions could be made to help them to connect with the kids and really, because as you said, the generations need to talk to each other. And so how can those men take that position now with their, their children to then work on how are we going to move forward in the future to create a better future post uh, coronavirus. I'll just have one, one thing to say about that. And I think that we have two ears and one mouth for a reason. And I think if parents listen to their children and children grow up feeling heard and, and appreciated, um, what we found is being heard is therapeutic being you know understood and accepted for who i am um and i think that's been in uh, severe lack for many generations where children should be seen and not heard and that I, might uh, be I'm a throwing on top of that as you said two eyes and uh, uh, I'm sorry two, two ears and one mouth you've also got two eyes as well so they should be in that mixture and therefore you're using the mouth less using your eyes and using your ears and really connecting with your children, seeing and hearing what's going on and what they, they feel like. And moving really on from that, having a very, sorry, Andy. Yeah, I was just gonna say most of my clients, I'm working with wound, wounds from their childhood, you know, mm. 50, 40, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, mm. uh, and dealing with their childhood. So if we start listening to our children, uh, that would be an, an advantage. Mm. Sorry, go yeah. ahead, Michael. No, that's okay. That's very good advice. Um, and, and I suppose uh, if I extrapolate out from that a little bit, I think we're starting to learn to take a more integrated approach towards life um, because we're starting to understand that family and work can actually coexist. Um, and so when we start to realise that family and work can coexist and we can integrate both into each other to provide a more connected experience with our family, um, and also start to pursue things that we're passionate about with some purpose, with an attitude of contribution. I think we will then find that not only will we have more connected families and more long lasting relationships between couples, but we'll also be inspiring our children to live according to their passions with a sense of purpose and contribution as well. So they grow up with good attitudes and good mindsets and they, they are always thinking that they're, they're not in situations where they're going, well, there's so many options, I don't know what to do because these uh, more self-aware parents now with a more integrated approach are taking a different approach to parenting and they're saying they're, they're starting to recognize and understand and listen to their children and see where their strengths are and what they're passionate about, what they love engaging in and supporting that and nurturing that. 
So really supporting those children in whatever it is that they're passionate about and you, what you support grows and what you mm. focus on grows, right? So in those children, I've seen this in my children as well, what you focus on, what, they, what they're passionate about, you support them mm. and that grows and it develops and of course, hopefully they end up doing something that they love with life. Mm. Yeah. That's it. And Thomas, how about you? I think um, going back to the the um, what you were talking about, Andy. Um, I think we're in a time now that we can set the legacy forward, in the sense of, okay, for example, um, when I become quite wealthy and have kids, and they have grandkids. Um, we're in a time where we can project or scope um, how we would like that third generation to, to fulfill uh, the legacy because we have things like Zoom, we have the internet, we have these modes of, of communication that, uh, that you definitely didn't have back in your time, Alan, um, with the, the, creation of the internet over the last 25, 30 years or whatever. Smoke signals. <laughs> Carrier pigeons. Uh, that's why I got the five behind me so I can get the smoke signals going. Yeah. But anyway, like, I remember, I remember yeah, times when no, I, was, I still remember when, when there was no internet. <laughs> I still remember when there was no internet and no mobile phones. So I'm old enough to remember that. Well, well, I remember my first computer had a 20 gig hard drive and that was... You know, I was getting into my thirties, I think, when we first when I first saw that. So, yeah, that's a long time ago. Technology's we'll grown that. so fast; it's incredible. Absolutely. So, and we and we we can use that to our advantage. Um, mm. It can it can show our grandkids who we are mm. or who we were, um, and, and it can really connect to the grandkids and and really uh, start to open their mind in a sense. So, mm. I think that's a, a positive that we can pull out of that um, so that hopefully the grandkids don't hmm. blow the money and, and poof up like smoke signals. Um, so yeah, like it, there's a lot of things that we can, we can look at and be grateful for to be able to change, um, change the future. So. Hmm. Excellent. Well, I think uh, communication is good, but it's the quality of the communication that is key. And just because we can communicate more and faster and greater bunches, I think, uh, you know, it's people like uh, you with, with a, a, you know, a deep faith and values and Michael and even Alan, uh, who we're going to, or Alan. Oh, are going to affect the future. Oh, you coughs on all these campfire chats, all of them. <laughs> I'll, I'll pray for you at the end, Alan. That's all right. <laughs> no, I, uh, clearly, Alan is creating the opportunity for us, uh, for 110 people to actually be communicating um, and also maintaining a standard of uh, the quality of the communication. Mm. I just think that with, that's one of the things um, you know, when, when, uh, Michael says he remembers when there was no internet, um, I probably remember 30 or 40 years of that. So, um, I, I, I had hoped that what I grew up with was information came through the radio or the television. It only came one way. And then with the internet, there was an opportunity to respond and you could then interact um, but now there's so much poor, bad, or um, horrific uh, communication on the internet that um, really the, the quality is, mm. uh, and the value of it, it needs to be mm, paramount, I think. Yeah. So as you say, I think, um, as I said, the, com the communication has just got to be right. It's it's got to be valuable and that's probably the best suggestion that I could think of of giving the men today when they're going, well, what are we going to do into the future? You know, you need to learn to do anything, learn to communicate, mm. focus on that communication, create that 
once you know how to communicate better, this is when you'll have better relationships with your partners and you'll have better relationships with your kids as well. And then as a family and all talking together and this is how you lead the family, not from being out in front of them, but being within the family itself. And I think for a long time, men led their families by being out there, you know, earning money and miss that advantage of being part of the family. And now, with what's going on around us at the moment, we've got a great opportunity to do just that and get to become part of the family. And then from there, step into our role and, and lead the family as well. But we only lead them by listening to them as well. So, okay, General, thank you very much for coming on today and uh, chatting with me. And I won't uh, thank you about the bagging. I'll co yes, I will. This is what it's all about. I just enjoy the fun that we have. You know, the laughter we've had, it's been really good. And as you said, uh, Andrew, we've had over um, 100 uh, people, about 110 people have had one-on-ones and that number's growing fast. We've got over 1,000 people in the group. The conversations, every conversation we've had, the one-on-ones, especially these panel discussions, of which there's been 60, over 60 of them now, every one of them have been respectful. We've all listened, we've talked with each other. And I think this is one of the things that we're leading by example. And so I'm hoping that everybody else out there who's listening to this is feeling the same way and that you want to get involved, have the one-on-ones with me and then start joining the panels and connect with all these men and women who are in the panel discussions and you know, get to know them and have those conversations, not only just in the Campfire Project, but outside of it as well. As I know uh, some of you have been really you know, good because I know that, um, uh, Michael, you've already been talking to some of the other members about building new programs together. And that's all come through having these chats and talking to each other. Yeah, so I'm exactly. really just loving it. And, even, and yes, I am loving the bagging as well. <laughs> well, by the well, way, my first car was a T-Rex. A what? A T-Rex. A T-Rex. <laughs> He's so young, he doesn't even know what it is. <laughs> oh, the, the education. Have you seen Jurassic Park? <laughs> nah, what was, that, what was that little cartoon? The, not Jurassic Park. The, Flint, the Flintstones? No, no, no. That's, that's <laughs> pretty apostolic. But, um... Yeah, I had a car like that. Paul was rusted. <laughs> I, my first car, you could see the road through the floor. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, before we get caught up and ca carrying on down another line <laughs> altogether, again, guys, thanks very much for being here. And for everybody else who's been listening in, thank you. And we'll see you on the, uh, the next panel discussion. Bye for now. All right.